sequence. Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. As we make our way through horror history, we can't go far without visiting one of the genre's most influential artists, the one and only David Cronenberg. With so many classics in his repertoire to choose from, it was hard to know where to start, so I picked what fans and critics consider his most accessible and celebrated film, one that showcases the hybrid of existential and biological sci-fi horror that became his trademark throughout the 70s and 80s. As with all our deconstructing episodes, we're going to explore this classic film in three parts. Origin, in which we trace the film back to its roots as a short story and 1958 film adaptation. Legacy, where I'll examine the film's impact on popular culture and its place in the golden age of 80s horror. And Mystery, where I'll dig into some lesser known facts, creepy trivia, and some interesting interpretations of the story. So prepare to take a dive into the plasma pool as we deconstruct David Cronenberg's legendary sci-fi horror classic. The Fly. While the original film is considered a classic by many fans, it hasn't aged that well. Although it stays true to the original short story, it plays fast and loose with the rules of science, even for the 50s. <laughs> During the peak of the 80s horror boom, The Fly seemed like the ideal story for a high-concept remake. Producer Stuart Kornfeld pitched the concept to the execs at Fox, who then hired screenwriter Charles Edward Pogue to write the first draft. Unfortunately, the studio didn't like what he wrote, but they made a deal with Kornfeld to distribute the film if he could finance it himself. Enter a second producer, Mel Brooks. Yes, that Mel Brooks. Hey, the Schwartz be with you. Brooks liked the concept and after a couple of rewrites went searching for a director. David Cronenberg was Brooks' first choice based on his reputation for shocking cerebral body horror like Videodrome. But Cronenberg had a prior commitment. He was preparing to direct Total Recall. As you probably know, that version fell through and a couple years later the gig went to Paul Verhoeven. But it freed up Cronenberg to direct The Fly, on the condition he'd be allowed to rewrite the script to fit his distinctive personal style. He also changed the character dynamics from a husband and wife relationship to the early days of a new romance, including the sexual aspects of that theme. Although they weren't the studio's first choices, Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis were ideal for the lead roles of Seth and Veronica. Not only did they have uniquely quirky personalities, their real-life relationship created natural on-screen chemistry. Cronenberg also made a perfect choice in hiring Chris Wallace and his team to design The Fly's extensive and gruesome special effects, which would eventually win the film an Oscar. Had the Academy been more open to horror films back then, I'm sure it would have taken home even more. The Fly is also the biggest hit of Cronenberg's filmmaking career, and it quickly established itself as an icon of modern culture. Its legendary tagline, conceived by Mel Brooks and delivered by Gina Davis, Be afraid. Be very afraid. Became a popular catchphrase around the world, and it's still used today. The movie itself is name-checked in countless TV shows, from Saturday Night Live to The Simpsons and Rick and Morty. Thankfully, no one has managed to fully develop a remake, at least not yet. But of course, there was a 1989 sequel directed by Chris Wallace himself, who loaded it with some impressive monster effects and buckets of gore and slime. It's gruesome fun, but lacks the dramatic power of its predecessor. Oddly enough, Cronenberg did adapt the film for another medium. In 2008, he directed an opera based on the screenplay. It was really a natural fit since Cronenberg felt the material was already operatic in scope. You can even feel it in the film's epic score by legendary composer Howard Shore. Attempts to develop a second sequel have also fallen through, at least on the screen. But the comic book series The Fly Outbreak is considered canon by fans of the film, and it picks up where The Fly 2 left off, continuing the story of Seth and Veronica's son Martin. As with any horror classic of this magnitude, fan theories, scholarly analysis, and the strange rumors have buzzed around the fly for decades, but here are the ones that interest me the most.
One of the more shocking rumors about the film turned out to be absolutely true. The first preview audience was so horrified by one particular scene that it was immediately cut from the final version. In this scene, Brundlefly tries desperately to reverse his horrific metamorphosis by splicing the genetic patterns of two animals, a second baboon and an ordinary cat. The result is disturbing enough, but it's Brundle's reaction that shocked audiences beyond their limits. They also hated an epilogue following the death of Brundlefly that revealed Veronica giving birth to a seemingly normal baby, which then sprouts a set of butterfly wings. Cronenberg didn't like it either because it ruined the dramatic punch of Seth Brundle's death, but he kept an earlier dream sequence which featured another kind of offspring. Cronenberg himself plays the obstetrician in this nightmare at Gina Davis's personal request. The director says he doesn't like doing cameos in his own films, but he has no problem appearing in other people's projects. In fact, he can be found in front of the camera more often than behind it these days. There really was a song written for the movie called Help Me by Brian Ferry and Nile Rogers, but you'll have to listen closely to hear it. The track was originally meant to play under the closing credits, and Cronenberg loved it, but it conflicted with the somber mood of the ending. Instead, he shifted it to the bar scene, where it's playing in the background just barely. This is a minor point, but since Cronenberg wanted the science of the fly to seem as realistic as possible, it's worth mentioning. Seth says the computer got confused when it found the fly's genetic pattern in the pod with him. But what about the trillions of microorganisms that already live in the human body? Gut bacteria, mites, and other creatures outnumber our own cells by 10 to 1. So why didn't Seth turn into E. coli man or a walking, talking eyelash mite? One fan theory suggests that Seth took those microscopic organisms into account when he taught the computer about the nature of the flesh. If he's truly a genius, something that important wouldn't just slip by him. But still, that doesn't explain why he didn't take better precautions against contamination before jumping butt naked into the pod. I'll let you figure out that one for yourself. And I'd also love to hear your own theories and interpretations of the fly. Let us know in the comments and tell us what you'd like to see deconstructed next. And be sure to like this channel and ring the little bell to get updates on all our horror content. Don't be afraid.